Welcome. The public entrepreneur is the subject of this module. We start working together to learn the art and science of problem definition, the first and the most essential skill of the effective public entrepreneur. Although it seems obvious, most of us, if we're honest, aren't very rigorous in defining the problem we're trying to solve. Instead, we prefer to jump to the solution, the bill, the app, the grant, the policy that we are proposing, and to start lobbying for its implementation. But when we fail to define the problem adequately, we can end up pursuing solutions that, no matter how innovative, simply do not work and fail to address the root cause of the problem. In contrast, good problem definition helps us to be clear about our ultimate goals. It enables us to identify actionable and specific opportunities where progress can be made within larger, seemingly intractable issues. And when undertaken collaboratively with stakeholders and partners, it invites collaboration through a compelling statement of what we're trying to accomplish. Okay, this short introduction to problem definition will enable you, first, to understand why problem definition matters. Second, describe and apply participatory processes for defining the problem. On the website, we have blank templates for the exercises we describe in this video for you to use. Okay, let's get started with an example. Recently, a government official I know was developing an innovative program to reduce school absences in his city. His plan was to send text messages to parents to remind them that school attendance was mandatory. He was excited about instituting this new approach for nudging people to change how they act in the hope that it would be more effective at combating truancy than simply the legislation that uh, mandates required attendance. But the text messaging solution assumed that the problem was parental behavior. He believed, as he put it, that parents were taking their kids to Disneyland on vacation during the school year. Yet, there was no data to suggest that going on vacation was the root cause of the problem. In fact, the real causes of lagging student attendance were related to parental neglect, bullying, and a lack of transportation. As a result, the text messaging solution likely wouldn't solve the problem of attendance. And my friend never got his idea off the ground, having failed to convince anyone to do the project because he didn't define the root causes, and he didn't do so in collaboration with the community. By contrast to that, the state of Oregon, the Department of Higher Education there, together with other state agencies, drafted a plan aimed at quantifying and addressing student absenteeism. Those agencies consulted substantial literature and research on the subject of chronic absenteeism to determine the root causes, allowing officials to properly define the problem in order to create a targeted framework for solving it. The key takeaway here, when we start with an incorrect definition of the problem, a project, no matter how innovative the solution, will be less likely to succeed. Okay, so what is problem definition? Problem definition has long been recognized as the first and essential step in any rational policymaking process. In fact, in any problem solving process. Yet, despite its acknowledged importance, policymakers rarely pay enough attention to the art and science of problem definition. And in a public context, it's especially important for problem definition to be undertaken with the residents who are most affected by the problem. As Albert Einstein famously said, if I had one hour to save the world, I would spend 55 minutes defining the problem and only five minutes on finding the solution. So what exactly do we mean by problem definition? Problem definition is the process of articulating a specific and actionable problem and identifying the root causes of that problem by using data, research, and collaboration. A sound problem definition, one that provides clear direction for a project, is a multi-stage process that always requires multiple drafts to arrive at. So let's work together to create a problem definition for your own work. To create a problem definition, we will start with a four-step process. First, we move from an issue to a problem. Second, we articulate the root causes. Third, we identify those most affected by the problem. And fourth, and finally, we reframe the problem. In later modules, we will talk more about how to build an evidence base to support our definition of the problem. But let's briefly explore each of these steps. The first draft of your problem definition is designed to get past a vague statement of the issue to articulate an actionable problem that lends itself to concrete solutions. So first, 
write down the issue you're trying to solve in a few lines. If there's more than one issue, go ahead and do a few versions of this exercise. It's very likely that your issue, be it climate change or poverty or school absenteeism, will be very broad when you start. Then write a one paragraph problem definition. It should address the basics. That includes what is the problem, when does it occur, and where does it occur. First, take care that the problem is not a solution in disguise. Second, avoid complex jargon when you write and also technical terms. And third, review the problem definition as a group as a collaborative exercise. The conversation may lead to identifying different problems. After identifying the issues we're trying to address, now we must add a description of the root causes to the definition of the problem. The better we can explain the problem, the better we can design a solution that addresses it at its roots. So, we want to ask ourselves, why do we think this problem is happening? And write down all the possible causes. This step in the process is designed to help you drill down and extract the problem at issue, peeling back the layers surrounding the broader issue to get to the root of the problem. Every big problem has small challenges associated with it, and those are more actionable. So, root cause analysis is a structured approach to identifying and articulating those underlying causal factors in order to spur a conversation about what is a real, as opposed to a perceived cause, or what's actually an effect. Although intuitive to most of us in daily life, root cause analysis emerged formally as a method in engineering in the mid-20th century as a way to diagnose manufacturing failure, failures ex post facto in an effort really to seek and remedy the ultimate source of a mechanical breakdown. The task, however, can usefully be applied to social and policy challenges just as well. Okay, so to do this, make a list of whys that describe why the problem is happening. Try to write down at least five of them. This is your initial list of root causes. Now, ask why those problems are happening and see if you can break down the root causes further. Repeat this exercise five times or until you can go no further. If you get stuck at any point describing the root causes, ask yourself, have I failed to identify a cause or do I simply need more research to finish this? It is helpful to ask why this problem is occurring at least five times to make sure that you have identified the most granular cause of the problem. This exercise will reveal at which level of granularity to tackle the problem and maybe also reveal multiple problems, each of which merits its own problem definition process. You may want to eliminate causes that upon reflection are not deemed to be significant in favor of keeping a few actionable causes for further work. The list of root causes should feature those causes that are actionable by you in particular. You want to end up with problems you can solve, collaborating with others, of course. Thus, in addition to avoiding vague generalities, you also want to focus on those causes that are within your jurisdictional purview for action. By now, your problem definition will start to expand into a true problem statement that fills at least one or two pages. Perhaps it even yielded multiple problem definitions. Again, always resist the temptation to jump to solutions. To illustrate, let's go back to our story of school absenteeism. The initial statement of the problem focuses on kids not coming to school. But do we know why they're not coming? Are their parents taking them to Disneyland during the school year to get cheaper rates? Or are their parents absent? Is coming to school less safe than staying home? Do they lack a way to get to school? Do they have to work instead of coming to school? These are examples of potential root causes of the problem. Almost invariably, this type of questioning, which takes some patience and discipline, I admit, it leads us to redefine the problem. In order to describe the problems fully, however, we need to understand the people most affected by the problem and their needs and incentives. So let's write down a list of those who are most affected by the problem. Here's a quick tip for this task. Try to avoid generic statements like the public in favor of a more specific description of those immediately impacted. For the absentee school children, who are they? Are the children evenly distributed across the state, or are they clustered in one county or one town? What types of children do not come? Are they at all ages or one age? Is absenteeism most prevalent in specific schools? When do they stay home? Is it at specific times of the year, like winter, 
or throughout the year. For example, one item on our list of those most affected by school absenteeism are children with single parents in low-income neighborhoods. Another might be middle school students in rural areas who do not have access to public transportation. It's also important to highlight that those affected might be both institutions, individual people, or both. Also, people may be affected at certain points in their lives, such as when signing up a child for school, or upon graduating from school, or when charged for a with a crime. The more we can zero in on time and place, the better we can discover possible solutions. Okay, once we've identified our affected parties, we can use this information to test our problem definition by interviewing those people and inviting them to review our problem definition. Realistically, we all know that we often have the solution in mind when we are developing a description of the problem. That's okay too. It's fine to end up at the place that we started, but going through the problem definition exercises helps us to ensure that our solution, as we've envisaged it, is indeed a response to a problem as real people actually experience it. It also helps us ensure that a potential solution is something we can actually bring to fruition. Okay, we're not quite done yet. Before completing our problem definition, it is important to determine if the problem can be reframed rather than simply diagnosed. That is to say, are there alternative ways of looking at the issue, from a different perspective perhaps, that might yield new insights? Okay, what do we mean by that? Take the famous example of the slow elevator. In the 1978 book, Art of Problem Solving, Russell Ackoff illustrates with the example of the slow elevator problem. Hotel guests complain to the manager that the elevator is too slow. So he consults an engineer who defines the problem mechanically and proposes the obvious, but expensive, solution of replacing the elevator engine. Then the manager, however, digs in deeper and he hires a psychologist. The psychologist reframes the problem. The elevator isn't too slow, rather, the weight is too annoying. Thus, instead of trying to solve the problem by speeding up the elevator, the manager hangs up a mirror next to the elevator for people to gaze into and pass the time more enjoyably. Problem solved. This solution reduced customer frustration and at a much cheaper cost. The mirror does not, of course, make the elevator go faster. Instead, it solves a different and more actionable problem, the annoying weight. By framing the problem differently, suddenly we discover a new opportunity. Another way to reframe the problem is to ask how to prevent the problem from arising in the first place. Instead of trying to solve the problem of too few people adopting dogs, when Lori Wise realized that about 30% of dogs that end up in shelters are owner surrenders, that opened up for her a new solution space. Far from being bad and heartless, surrendering owners were often simply too poor. They were having to choose between feeding their dog or feeding their children. Thus, by helping original owners keep their pets, in other words, solving the problem upstream from how she originally defined it, communities could reduce the number of animals in kill shelters. Finally, let's improve our definition by lassoing it. Alpheus Bingham, pictured here, founder of Inocentive, the online community for distributed problem solving, created this test for creating a good problem definition. LASSO, L-A-S-S-O, stands for limited, actionable, specific, supported, and owned. L, have I limited the scope? In other words, have I narrowed a large problem down to a more readily definable, smaller problem? A, have I described something actionable? Make the problem clearer by describing a problem we can realistically do something about. S, have I described something specific? Make the problem more actionable by being concrete and detailed in my description. S, have I described a problem that will be supported? In other words, will my organization care enough about the problem to take action and invest in an evaluation process to determine whether the solutions will work? And finally, O, have I identified a problem owner? Someone needs to be on point to manage the problem-solving process and communicate back to collaborators. Thus, in a well-authored problem definition, someone specific has to have responsibility to manage the solution process. These last two criteria are of paramount importance. 
Many problems are compelling, and all problems have numerous root causes. But we are, once again, looking for those problems and root causes that are solvable by us or by our agency. What if we work with a coalition of partners? Sure, working together is a way to do things, but it has to be something we can tackle. Some problems are simply going to be either too big or too far outside of our jurisdiction to be something that we can currently impact, either alone or together. The next steps to defining a problem seem simple, but there are some common pitfalls. These include the constant temptation to articulate a solution rather than a particular problem. The identified problem is too broad to be actionable. It may also not be actionable by you with the resources that you have at your disposal. The failure to articulate assumptions and root causes and to identify who else may already be working on the problem is another common pitfall. The lack of success metrics that are needed to assess if a solution works is another challenge many people face. Okay, when you feel excited about a possible solution, defining the problem can feel like it's slowing you down. But it soon yields benefits in terms of collaboration from others, the ability to demonstrate impact, and most importantly, making a real improvement in people's lives. Thank you.